Good morning, Restoration Church. My name is Sebastian Masson, and I get to be one of the pastors here. Uh, I would like to say thank you to all of those who are here today. But the fact is that I'm actually preaching this sermon to an empty room. Uh, so I actually preached this uh, message a couple weeks ago. But the recording and the live stream, uh, we had a bunch of technical difficulties with that. So I am re-recording the sermon from several weeks ago now. So thank you for tuning in online and watching this video. So uh, this week we're actually going to be in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 19 through 26. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. Well, I'm actually now, I'm not even going to have those verses up on the screen. So <laughs> if you have your Bibles... Uh, please turn to Philippians 1, 19 through 26. If you don't have your Bible, please uh, go grab one or you can, you can find it on the Bible app. So we'll be in Philippians 1, 19 through 26, and it reads like this. It says, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not, a, not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means a fruitful labor for me. Which, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let us pray. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we just, uh, once again, just in awe of you, Lord, Lord we are just... Uh, amazed by even the words that you speak to us. Father, we just pray that right now as we go into uh, your word and as we start to dissect what, what you have here in the book of Philippians, Father, we just pray for a calming. We pray for understanding. We pray for wisdom. We pray for knowledge to be able to discern what you are telling us here in this word. Father, once again, we're just grateful for this opportunity to do this. And Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as we look at our passage this morning, there's one verse, which is verse 21, that most people have heard before, and many people have quoted, and it's here where Paul writes, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, even though that verse is well known, I'm not sure that it's actually well understood seems easy enough to, to grasp this intellectually, but I'm not so sure how we really grasp this and hold on to this spiritually. Too often we can hear verses like this and we say yes and we amen it, but we don't necessarily take the time to meditate on it, to sit on it, to reflect on it. Because if we were to really take time to reflect on this verse, we would have to ask ourselves two questions. First, do, do I really live for Christ? And everything that I do in my life, in, in my workplace, and, and everywhere I go, do I really live for Christ? And the second question would be, do I really see dying as a means of gain? I think if we're all honest, we'd all agree that we've had times in our lives where we have not been living like Christ. Where our purpose and intention in life has not been to glorify Christ, but rather it's been to glorify ourselves. And then at the same time... I also think we've struggled with seeing death as a means of gain. We look forward to having peace and being with God in heaven, but it's almost like, well, but not just yet. I remember when I used to think how great it will be for Christ to come back and I'll be in heaven with him and everything will be perfect. No more pain, no more suffering, no more bills anymore. I might have some hair as well, but rather... Uh, I would I would get joyful about that, but then at the same time, I would rather I would say, like, ah, you know, I want that, but not just yet. Not just yet. Lord, Lord, don't come just yet, because I want to get married first. I, I want to see how I do in my career first. Uh, Father, I, I want to see my kids first. I, I want to grow up with them. 
I remember a while ago, I wanted to be in ministry, uh, full-time ministry, really bad. And I used to have this fear that Jesus would come back before I ever got the chance to do full-time ministry. I was like, Lord, I want to be with you, I really, but I really want to preach first. I really want to invest in a church body. I want to be a pastor first. I know heaven's obviously better, but, but that doesn't matter. Like, just wait, let me, just wait a little bit. And now that I'm here and I'm, and I'm preaching and I'm pastoring, it's like, Jesus, we did it. Like, you can come back now at any time. That's fine with me. I'm ready. And, and we've all thought like this, truthfully, where we don't want to experience, where we want to experience something before we die or before Jesus comes back for us. We've all done this, but the problem with thinking like this is that we don't think of death as a means of gain, but rather we think that death will cause us to lose out on things here. We have, we have FOMO, fear of missing out on the things of life, missing out on experiences, missing out on accomplishments and goals. And the reason why we fear missing out on them is because our eyes are focused on those things rather than on Christ himself. Now, these are not bad things. Experiencing having children or grandchildren or your marriage or a good career or retirement, like these are all good things. To live long is a good thing, but when we look at those things as our hope and for our joy, when we live for those things over living for Christ, then death really just seems like an end to what we're really living for. But if Christ is over everything else, then this stuff doesn't matter anymore because you're not losing out on what you're living for, but rather death is the chariot that will get you to eternal life in the presence of the one whom you have been living for. What we'll find today is that living for Christ and seeing death as a gain really goes hand in hand. The Apostle Paul, who's the author of this letter to the Philippians, he's able to make this statement because he really lives for Christ. And because of that, he really sees death as a gain. But the question is, how? Like, how, how does he really live for Christ? How can Paul really live every aspect of his life for Christ. And how do we understand even the way that Paul did this? Well, that leads me to point number one, which is this. When we understand our deliverance, we will understand who we live for. When we understand our deliverance, we will understand who we live for. Look at the end of verse 18 and into verse 19. It says this. It says, yes. And I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, the key word here is deliverance. At first glance, it can seem that Paul is talking about actually being delivered from prison. If we remember, uh, Paul has been in prison in Rome. He's been under house arrest. He's chained to a guard at all times, and he's awaiting the ruling from Caesar, which will say that either he's going to be set free or he will be executed. And if we just look at this word deliverance, we can think that he's saying that he will be set free from prison because of their prayers for him and because of the help of the Holy Spirit. But what's interesting is that he's not talking about being delivered from house arrest, but rather he's talking about something far greater. The word used here for deliverance in the Greek is actually better translated as salvation. And when we understand this as salvation, the next verse makes much more sense because Paul says this. He says, this will turn out for my deliverance. And then in verse 20, he says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So what Paul's saying here is that, yes, by their prayers and by the help of the Holy Spirit, one day he's going to be delivered. This could be a physical deliverance from prison where he's set free, but it also can mean that he's going to be delivered from this life as a whole through his death. But either way, whether he lived or he died, he was delivered. Paul had already been delivered in the fact that he had already obtained salvation through Jesus Christ. 
Paul had already acknowledged the fact that he was a sinner and was in need of a Savior. He's already come before the feet of Jesus and repented of his sins and declared that Jesus was his Lord and Savior. He already established the fact that salvation comes only through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was already an adopted child of God because of his faith in Christ. And because of that, he knows that whether he lives or he dies, he will be delivered. He will have salvation, not because of what Paul himself has done, but only because of what Jesus Christ has done for him on the cross. You see, Paul understood that his deliverance was his salvation. And then on top of that, in verse 20, again, he says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. You see, he has an eager expectation expectation, an eager expectation and a hope, which means that he is certain and he is longing for this reality that he will not be ashamed. That even though Caesar or the world or other preachers that are talking bad about him or false accusations being thrown at him, throughout all of that, he has this eager longing, this eager certainty that when all is said and done, he will not be ashamed. No one can shame him. And why? It says this, because, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul says, No one can shame him because now, as always, Christ is honored in his body. Whether that is by the way that I live, by the way that I act, by the way that I speak, or by the way that I even die for Christ's name, in every single way, through my life and through my death, I will honor Christ with my body because he has delivered me. Because he has given me salvation through his name. I have responded by honoring Christ in my life and my death. And no matter what happens to me, I will not be ashamed. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now what's interesting about that verse, in verse 21, is the Greek phrase uh, does not include the verb is. So if we did a literal translation of this verse, it would actually read, for me to live, Christ, and to die, gain. For me to live, Christ. For me to die, gain. For me, this makes this verse so much stronger because Paul knew that to live is Christ. He knew that he would, uh, as he lived, he would continue to serve him with, with everything that he had. And if he died in the process, that's a gain because now he gets to go and be in the presence of God forever. But everything that Paul consumed himself with was Christ. Every ounce of his being was Christ. Every time he talked to people, every time that he preached, every time that everything that he did, he lived for Christ. And the only reason to live was Christ. And when people would try to shame him by persecuting him, which eventually would lead to his death, they thought that they would shame him. And in that, he would say, ha, I'm not ashamed because this is a gain. I honored Christ with my life and my death. Paul understood his deliverance. He understood his salvation. Because of that, he understood who he lived for. He says, for for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My question is, can we say the same? Can we truly say, for to me to live, Christ, and to die is gain? Does our understanding of our deliverance, of our salvation, cause us to think that to live is Christ? Are we able to say that we are eagerly awaiting the day where we can be truly unashamed as we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm unashamed because I honored you with my life and in my death. Listen, being a Christian is more than just praying a prayer one time or raising your hand once or walking down an aisle at an altar call. It's more than just coming here on Sunday mornings. The term Christians actually means little Christ. You see, to call ourselves Christian is to say to live Christ, to die again. 
It means that because we understand our salvation, we want to and we have to live our lives to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. See, this is a calling for all of us to evaluate whether or not we truly understand our deliverance from sin. If we truly understand our salvation through Jesus Christ, if we really grasp our total depravity and our dependence on his salvation, then we will have no choice but to live for Christ. And when we understand our salvation and we live for Christ, then we will have no choice but to look at at death as a gain. Because death will bring us into the presence of our creator, into eternal life with him. But now here's the the other side of that. If you don't have salvation, if you haven't been delivered from your sins, if you haven't put your faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you are just living for yourself, then the reality is that death is not a gain for you at all. You can't say that death is a gain because the only thing that you will gain is the penalty of your sin. You will receive the wages of your sins which means that you will spend eternal life apart from Christ. And the Bible is clear that those who die without a relationship with Jesus spend the rest of their life, eternal life, in a place of torment where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there will be a lake of fire, where there will be just utter darkness. You will be totally separated from God in his goodness forever. And this is just a real reality. I'm not just trying to scare you into Christianity. I don't do that. But this is a reality of death without faith in Christ. So if you're here today and you haven't put your faith in Christ, then I implore you to do that right now. Come before him, repent of your sins, turn away from the world and and your sins and your temptations and turn towards God. Understand that he bore your sins on the cross so that you won't have to pay for them in eternal damnation. He took on your guilt, your sin, your shame on the cross so that he can give you his righteousness. If you'd only put your faith in him. And when we do this, we can also have confidence in our deliverance and salvation. And that will lead us to be able to say, to live for Christ and to die gain. We're going to live like Christ because we know what he has saved us from. And when we see death as a gain, because we will get to go be with him. Now the question is, what is this? look like? What does it look like to live for Christ? And what does this require from us? That leads me to point number two. It's this, to live for Christ requires sacrificial and fruitful labor. To live for Christ requires sacrificial and fruitful labor. Look at verse 22. It says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. You see, Paul, he says that for him to live in the flesh, if he's going to continue to live, it means that he's going to have to continue to labor for Christ. And listen, labor is not easy. The word itself means to work hard, to make a great effort. And when we think of the word labor, when we think about work, when we think of hard, we think of hard work. Even for those here who've had children, when your water breaks and, and you start having contractions, you, you go to your spouse and what do you say? You say, oh, I'm going into labor. Yeah, you're going into, you're going into work. <laughs> you're about to go do some hard work. Giving birth is hard work. When we think of hiring workers for a construction job or some sort of hot job outside that you don't want to do, we, we say we need to hire some manual labor. And here's the thing, when we think about laboring for Christ, we also have to understand that this takes work as well. Hard work. But this is not just laboring for the sake of laboring. This is a labor where you just, you know, that doesn't even make a difference, where you're just digging a hole and you're filling it back in. No, this says that this is a fruitful labor, meaning that what he is doing is the work of the Lord. We're laboring for Christ. To live 
is Christ means to labor in the ways that Christ wants you to labor. And listen, this type of fruitful labor can look different for everyone. But in every way we labor, we must view it as a way to glorify Christ. Some of us, our fruitful labor is invested in raising our children. Raising our children is hard work. Amen? It is labor intensive. But if we view the way that we raise our children as a way to glorify Christ, then it will be fruitful. If you see the fact that raising your children is a labor that Christ himself has given to you. He hasn't given this labor to their teachers or to people on TV or celebrities or anyone else. He gave this labor of parenting to you. And if we take the responsibility to disciple our own children and take responsibility to guard them and to guide them in the ways of the Lord, if we take that labor of parenting and we say, Lord, I may not really know what in the world I'm doing. And I'm going to have my ups and downs. But, but Father, you gave me these children. So I'm going to work hard for them in your name. So that they know that the reason I care so much about them is because I want them to see you. This type of labor with the Holy Spirit will bear fruit. Or, or how about how we work at our jobs? You may not like where you work or what you do, but, but guess what? The Lord has given you that work. He has given you that job and career to provide for yourself and for your family. So we need to look at our job like the gift that it actually is. We have to look at our work as if Christ himself gave you that work. Because he did. So whether we're a CEO of a company, whether we're a janitor just taking out the trash, we have to understand that that we do these things not to please our bosses, but rather we do this because we are working For Christ. Christ gave you that labor. And listen, the way that we work at our jobs, it matters. Because when people hear that you're a Christian, but they see that you have a lousy work ethic, that you hate your job, you're always disgruntled, you're always calling in, they're going to second guess if you're actually a believer. Non-believers look at the way you work, and they judge your faith based on your work ethic and your attitude. I've heard it. I've heard it said before. Oh, how does that person, how, how are they a Christian? They're the laziest ones here. They're never here. They call out, can't even find them. We have to look at our jobs and in everything that we do as something given to us by God. While we are here on, the, on this earth, in this flesh, we've been given work by Christ. And it is in everything that we do. In all our labors, we are to do it for Christ. Colossians 3, 17, it says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything that we do is for him. And when we do this work for Christ through the Holy Spirit, he will make it fruitful. Now, Paul's fruitful labor, his was to establish churches and build them up. His labor was to preach and to teach the gospel. And we also know that his labor was sacrificial. Paul suffered through his laboring for Christ. From from the beginning, he was persecuted, he was slandered, he was imprisoned, he was accused of all types of stuff, all these things, even including anxiety and worry. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul, he outlines many of the sufferings that that, that he had to deal with, but at the very end, he says this, he says, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul had a lot going on. He had many pains and struggles as he labored for Christ, and even the anxiety of carrying the weight of all of these churches. He had tons of responsibility. But even in that, look at what he says in 22 and 23. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, Which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. He says that he's hard-pressed between these two decisions. He says he doesn't know which one he would choose, to be done with all of this and be with Christ, or to stay and continue this fruitful labor, this hard work. And when he says hard-pressed 
Uh, he means that he feels like he's in this tight corridor or tight alleyway where the walls are kind of closing in o- on him and he, he can feel both walls and it's like, ah, you know, he feels this way because his desire is to depart and be with Christ. Paul's desire is to depart, to be done, to loosen up the ropes that connect the boat to the moorings and set sail and be with, be with Christ. And he says that this would be far better, but not just better, it, it would be far, far better. And obviously it would because all of this labor, all of this hardship that he's going through would be over. He would be with Christ. He would have freedom. But the question is, if it's so much better to go and be with Christ, why is he so, has such a hard time deciding between laboring and going with Christ? Shouldn't that be an easy decision? Why is this such a hard choice for Paul? Well, look at what he says in verse 24. It says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He says that even though his desire is to go and be with Christ, that it would be far better, that his work would be done. He says, but look, this, this ain't about me. And that same desire that I have to go be with Christ is the same desire that I have to be here to help you. Yes, going to Christ would be easier, but it's not about having it it easy. It's about taking this labor, this work that God Almighty, the creator of everything, he's entrusted to, to me this work to share the gospel, to build churches. And he says that this is a hard choice, but he will sacrifice the easy to complete the work that God has laid out for him. And all of this ties back to what he said in verse 15. Uh, 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 what he said about 15 verses earlier, right? In Philippians 1, verse 6, he says this, he says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now my question to everyone is will we sacrifice our own desires of comfort in order to labor in the work that the Lord has given us? Will we Will we sacrifice our comfort in order to labor in the ways Christ has asked us to labor? We all desire comfort. We all want what is easier. But when we see that the Lord has given us our children, our spouses, our work, our church, whatever it is, he's given us all these areas to have fruitful labor for his name. When we understand that, we can put aside our comfort and we can sacrifice ourselves in order to do his work. And that leads me to my last point. Is this. Our labor continues for our joy and his glory. Our labor continues for our joy and his glory. Look at verses 25 and 26. He says this. Convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So we talked, we talked earlier uh, that Paul knew that he was delivered, whether by life or by death. Uh, either way, he's okay. He has salvation. But then he says here, he, he says that, that, he, that he'll actually be released from prison. He doesn't think that his time with them is up just yet. He thinks that his presence is necessary for them. So he says in verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and join the faith. He's like, listen, I'm here for you. I think I'm going to stay and I think I'm, I'm going to continue with you all for your progress and for your joy in the faith. Now this word for progress is prokope in the Greek, which means ad- advancing against obstacles or facing continual resistance. Advancing against obstacles or facing continual resistance. So Paul's telling them that, that he is still here to help them progress. Still here to help them advance against all these different obstacles that are coming their way. That he will still be there to help them move forward in their faith. And the beautiful thing about progressing in your faith, about facing challenges in your life, and seeing the Lord continue to work through them, is that your progress As you overcome life's obstacles, you will also receive joy in this progress. See, laboring for Christ is hard, but your joy in the faith grows 
as you push forward in your labor for Christ. And not only that, because as you sacrifice your own comforts for the sake of others to help them progress, you also receive joy in Christ's work. You see, joy comes to the believer who understands their salvation. They understand their deliverance. So they live for Christ and they have this fruitful labor for him. And it's in this labor, in this work for Christ that we progress in our faith and we help others progress in their faith. And in that, we have joy. Fighting for joy begins with living and laboring for Christ. Doing the work that he has begun in you brings joy. And not only does their labor bring joy, but it also brings glory to God. Look at verse 26. The reason why Paul continues with them for their progress and for their joy is this, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. He's like, listen, the way that I, the, the way that I continue to in this work and in this labor will cause them to glorify God. Listen, when we do what we are called to do, when we labor for Jesus Christ, when we truly live by that statement to live Christ, to die, gain. When we live in this way, others will look at us and have ample cause to glorify the name of Jesus. When we see people in the workplaces treating their jobs as mission fields and doing their work to the glory of God, we also glorify God. When we see mothers and fathers caring for their children and raising them up in the scriptures and teaching them right from wrong, when we see that, we also glorify God. When we see missionaries leaving the comforts of their home to go into work for Christ, we also glorify God. When we see people treating their neighborhoods as a place of witness, to, uh, to witness of Jesus to others, we, we also glorify God. Anywhere that we see others living for Christ, we glorify God. And listen, we can all glorify God together as we see others living for Christ. But can we say that others are able to give glory to God by the way that we labor for him? Do we, do we even want that? Do we want others to look at us and see Christ? Not out of selfish motives or look at me, look what I do, but rather do our actions point directly back to Christ? And listen, I, I can't make you want that. I honestly pray for all of us to have this hunger inside of us to have that, to want to have this type of faith in order for us to all be able to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want us to believe that and I want us to live that out. I want that for all of us. But here's the thing. If you're here today and, and you want that for yourself, what you need to do right now is remember the gospel. Remember the good news. You must remember your deliverance and your salvation. Remember the fact that you were once lost and dead in your trespasses, but God, being rich in mercy, sent his son to die on the cross in order that we may be alive together with him. Remember that our salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ and that we have been adopted into his family through our faith and we have inherited eternal life where we, where we will live forever with no pain, no suffering, no anxiety, and no more worry. Remember this good news of your deliverance because when you get that, you will labor for Christ in every area of your life. I want everyone to think this week of all the things the Lord has given you to labor in. Think of them. Write them down. And then ask, how can I do these things to the glory of God? How can I look at these areas of work that I've been given by the Lord and do them in a way that glorifies God and do it with a heart of thankfulness? And then pray that the Lord will give you a mind to look at your work with a different mindset, one of purpose and one of gratitude. Really wrestle with this and labor for Christ and be sacrificial and think of others over yourself and over your comfort, because then you will progress to bring joy to yourself and to others around you, and, to and together we will glorify the name of God because of it. To live Christ, and to die, gain. Let us pray.
Father, just grateful for your word. We are grateful for our deliverance, for our salvation through faith in your life, death, and resurrection. We are grateful that, that death it does not mean the end of our happiness, but Lord, death is a gain because we get to go be with you. Father, help us to see death as a means of gain, but Father, even more, help us to live the way that you want us to live. Help us to live and labor in the work that you have given us. Help us to see every aspect of our life as a way of laboring for you. Because we are no longer our own, but we were bought with a price. Lord, help us to glorify you in our bodies. Father, we just thank you once again for your goodness and your faithfulness towards us. And we love you and we thank you and we pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.